him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man learned that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. And then this is number, verse 4. This is kind of where we're going to focus on this morning. It says, These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, having the, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they were without fault before the throne of God. We want to see this, and again, verse 4 is going to be our focus because we are living in the end times. How many of us really believe that? We are living in this end times. And so this book of Revelation says that this is the book for us. This is for us living in the end times. And he's looking at this, and again, we're not going to get into the controversy. It's been years, but I know in the past, you know, people used to argue about the 144,000, right? Is it literal, right? And we, look at, uh, we looked at, uh, at people like... Uh, uh, like Noah, you know, well, there wasn't too many saved. And we looked about, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, and there was just Lot and his family, so there wasn't too many saved and, and these things. And then there's other people who say, well, it's, it's symbolic. You know, there's going to be a great multitude saved. But this morning I want to say that's not important. It's not important whether it's symbolic or it's literal. What is important is that we live a life to say, Lord, I want to be one of those 144,000. I want it because this is for the last day. And I said, so these are the last day disciples that we have to be prepared, that we have to live a life uh, for him and through him. I want to look at these notes. And I want to look at this uh, really, really quick. And it says here, right, uh, in this note, on this one, it says, they are robed, if we search the Bibles, that, that these 144,000 will be robed with the white linen of Jesus Christ. You know, in reality, all of us who accept Jesus Christ now and today can have that robe, right? That robe of Christ's righteousness. And it's his robe. And that, so he's trying to prepare us now to live in these last days. And in my notes it says that... Um, that the same righteousness of the saints, it says, but all who follow the Lamb in heaven must first follow Him here on earth. If we want to have that mindset, right? If we want to have that mindset, you know what? I want to follow my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, wherever He goes in the new heavens, in the new earth. You know, we're promised, and we, we, it wasn't that long ago, it's only been a several months at the at the end of the year here that we finished our Daniel and Revelation seminar right and so we know through that study that that Christ is going to bring to earth the new Jerusalem and that he's going to spread and clean this earth and that we're going to live on this earth for all eternity but that's not the only thing but he says he promised that not only will we live on this earth for all eternity but he promises to live with us here on this earth of all of the worlds out there at least from what I gather from the scriptures and the spirit of prophecy of all the worlds that are, God has created more than this one world and of all the worlds we are the only ones that have sinned and yet even though that we have sinned and he gave his life to redeem us to call us back he says I promise that I will live with you for all eternity. Is that an awesome thing? Just to think about it. But he says, but if you want to follow me, if you want to follow me on, in heaven or in this new earth and the new kingdom, 
It says that you need to learn to follow me for all eternity. You need to follow me now while you're here on this earth. We have to learn to be, uh, make him number one in our lives and who we are. And so when I was looking at the scripture, it says here that, that these, these, these 144,000 says they were not defiled with women. It says because they were not, that made them virgins. And so I wanted to look at that. So what does it mean to be the virgins? What does it mean for them? And I kind of looked and, and, I, and I remember that story. Do you guys remember that story? Uh, of the ten virgins, right? Matthew 25, Matthew chapter 25, those, there were ten virgins. And you guys, if we could look at that, there was ten virgins. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. Amen. And I want to say this morning that, that those, the five foolish virgins, they were not hypocrites. They sincerely believed that the bridegroom was coming. Amen? I mean, is, is that, that kind of paint a picture for us, right? Because we believe that the bridegroom was coming, isn't it? He's talking to us about in these last days. He says, those five fullest virgins, they believed that the Jesus was coming. They believed that the bridegroom was coming. They believed and they helped proclaim the message. They helped say that, you know, Jesus is coming and the bridegroom is coming. Let us go and be prepared. And they all had their lamps. And all ten of them slept. Right? There's a short period. We have to, we, we have to be careful. But, but there was a time when they heard the call. They said, Jesus is coming. The bridegroom is coming. And they, they got up and they arose. And, and then there, was, there was five, the wise and the five foolish. And the five wise had what with them? Oil, right? Which represents the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the five... Uh, wise virgins they had they had the oil with them they had the holy spirit that means that they were really spending that extra time with god they were spending that extra time in prayer they were spending that extra time learning and and, and reading right and and being uh, uh in tune with jesus and but the five fullest virgins they didn't take the time out they didn't take the time out and i'm and i'm just you know, I'm just thinking about our church here in, the, in, the, in these last days. You know, that we, I said, we, we need to take the time out and make, make our, our Sabbath school priority. Amen? We need to be here for Sabbath school. We need to make our Sabbath worship priority. We're here to worship God. And we need to make prayer meeting priority. And then we need to make witnessing priority. Because, uh, you know, as we see, and I said, well, you know, it's just, it's just, it just came to my mind this, this, this week as, as we visited with, with Sister Kay and now with, with the news. You know, those of us that are, are, are 65 and maybe even 60, we can even lower that. <laughs> you know, we're not guaranteed, right? We're, we, we have health. I mean, I remember seeing Sister Kay last Sabbath at the wedding. She looked healthy. She looked fine. And, and all of a sudden, you know, she had that stroke and, and just couldn't speak, couldn't talk anymore. And then as I look at us as our church, and I'm thinking, you know, I just want to focus on North Vernon here this morning for a second. Uh, there's a lot of us that are almost in that same boat, right? We can, we can be healthy today, and in a few days, we, we don't know. Where, where are we going to be at? If, if, if we as a young folks, I want to just talk to the young people too here now, if we don't want to step up, if we don't say that, you know, this Jesus thing, it's not a priority. It's just Jesus is not, it's not it's just that important. Where, where's, where is, uh, where's our North Vernon Church going to be here in a, in a year or two or, or three? Where were we at? We have to learn then, right? Do, do I want to be a disciple at the end times? And I think maybe if we have that, I don't know if that's uh, PowerPoint, if that could if we can put that up. I'm seeing that's on there. If it will open, I don't know if it will open. Will it open up? Okay. Here you go. So it's got the last days, right? This last day of disciples. I want to read this, these kind of, this quotes for you. I don't know if you can see it up here, but I'll read this, right? And it says, These are they which are not defiled with women, 
and they are virgins. These are they which what? Follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These are redeemed from the Lamb, being the first fruits unto God, unto the Lamb. And we see that this is important, that we are living in the last days. And I want to see this next note right from Ezekiel. So we're looking at, so how do we know? This is, I think, for me, this is one of the, the characteristics of the, of, the, of the five foolish virgins. The five foolish virgins. And it says here for, out of Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 31 through 33. And it says, And they came unto thee as the people cometh, and they sat before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that has a pleasant voice that can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. And when this cometh to pass, and lo, it will come, they, then shall they know that a prophet has been among them. Here was the five fullest versions, right? They, they loved to hear the word. They loved to be, they wanted to be maybe, maybe entertained, right? They wanted to go to the wedding. They wanted to be at the reception. They wanted to, to, to partake of the, the food and the, and the drink and, and of the fellowship. But it says here, they came and they heard the words uh, of the prophet, but they didn't do them. I think that those, those five fullest versions were, were in that place. And, and I just wonder then today as we're, as we're nearing the Christ's second coming, are, can, we, can we fall into the same category? Right? Can we come week after week? Right? That, that was because the, the, of all the virgins were, were, they were all in the church. Right? They were all, there was no distinction. They, one, it, wasn't, it didn't say that one believed and others didn't believe. They all believed. They all were together. Right? But they came and they listened and they said it was, they, yeah, we know that this is nice and this is, I know this is what we're supposed to do. But they didn't follow through. They didn't follow through on God's words and God's promises and what, um, what they were to do for him. So I'm going to read here and this is the Spirit Prophecy quote. And it says that, but in order to accept um, the invitation to the gospel feast, they must make their worldly interests subordinate to the one purpose of receiving Christ and his righteousness. God gave all for man, and he asked him to place his service above every earthly and selfish consideration. He cannot accept a divided heart. The heart that is absorbed in earthly affections cannot be given up to God. You know, those were those five fullest versions, right? They wanted... Uh, you know that old saying when I, was a, when I was a kid, they always used to tell me when I wanted to uh, have all the benefits but not really work for anything, they used to tell me I wanted to have my cake and eat it too, right? And, and that's, those were those five fullest versions, right? They wanted to have the cake, but they didn't want to, uh, they didn't want to uh, participate. They didn't want to help out. Uh, that story when I was a kid, right? I forget what it was, but uh, this lady was making, uh, it was one of those animal stories and she was making cakes and she was inviting people to bring wood and to help with the harvest and nobody would do that and only the few and then when she finished making the cakes she, she wasn't able to share with anybody else because it wasn't enough for everybody. You, know, you guys remember that story? The childhood story? Amen. And that fits here with us, right? This God is saying that. We want that. He says, the lesson is for all time. We are to follow the Lamb of God wherever He goeth. He said, His guidance is to be chosen his companionship valued above the companionship of family, of earthly friends. Christ says, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. He says, so it's good to love our family and friends. It's good to love our children. It's good to love our fathers. But our commitment, our number one commitment is to whom? God, amen. And then to this extended family, to our, our relationship here on earth, but we have to read that. And I mean, we have to temper that, right? I'm not just saying if you have somebody that's sick at home that you got to tend to them, that you abandon them and leave them alone. No, that's, that's not what we're saying. 
What we're saying is that though, you know, that our focus can't be just on, on family. And I think, and what I'm, maybe what I'm trying to say is sometimes, and I know I've mentioned it, is that I, I hear, especially as a pastor, that people have family come out of town and the family may not be Adventist and they don't want to come to church and so we make excuses to stay home to entertain them. You know? Uh, but God is saying, no. You know, if they, don't, if they don't repent and they don't turn around, they're not going to be in that heavenly kingdom. But guess who is? God says, I'm going to be there. If you want to be with me, then you have to make me priority. You have to make me number one. You have to be willing to sacrifice just like I did. I was willing to sacrifice my only begotten son, right? And Jesus, and I've said this in the past, I believe, I, I don't have a scripture or a spirit of prophecy code to, to back this up, but I believe that Jesus, before he was born in Bethlehem, had the ability to be omnipresent, that he was, had the ability to be in all places at all times, just like God the Father is right now just like the Holy Spirit. But when he came to this earth and took on human form and died for us, he gave that privilege up for all eternity. He said, you know, he said, that was a, a sacrifice for all eternity. And he says, you know what? If I can sacrifice part of my Godhead, part of my, 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 my ability to be at all places at one time, that you might have eternal life, you can give up a little bit of, of time too right? You can give up. He's not asking. He's not asking for 24-7, but he's asking us to, to make priorities to read and to study, right? He's, he's asking us for a priority to become disciples, right? He's asking us to do that. It says, uh, and there's another spirit across the culture, it says, and then around the family board or at the dinner, right, at home, uh, when you're eating, this is when breaking their daily bread, many in Christ's day repeated the words, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. It says, but Christ showed how difficult it was to find guests for the table provided at the infinite cost. Those who listened to his words knew that they had slighted his invitation to mercy. To them, worldly possessions, riches, and pleasures were of all absorbing and one consent they had made excuses. And that talking about that parable, right? When, when the king had that feast and he invited them, everybody says, well, you know, I just got married. I, I can't make it. Uh, or I just bought some oxen. You know, I have to try them out. I can't make it. And so Jesus, uh, or the king, told his, his servants, well, go down to the hedges and the highways and the byways and, and compel, compel the others to come. You know, that's, that's a story telling us today. You know, we got, we got plenty of room here in this little church, don't we? Uh, we got room for another, what, 50, 60 folks? All right, yeah. He said, we need to be out there compelling. Tell them, hey, come on, we got a wedding feast that we're going to go to. That's what those 10 virgins were waiting for, weren't they? They said, we got to fit in. We're, we're invited. And there's a lot of folks not making, making excuses. And he says, but we need to compel them. We need to be with them. And we're going to go this one. One more. And it says, who are, the, are, who are the subjects of the kingdom of God? So who, who are they then? Who, who's going to make it? He says, all those who do his will, they have righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So do we find peace and joy in, in worship? Do we find peace and joy being here Sabbath morning? Do we find peace and joy uh, being at Sabbath school? Do we find peace and joy being at prayer meeting? Do we find peace and joy, you know, studying studying the scriptures? Do we find peace and joy giving Bible studies? And it says, uh, I'll find my place. It says, the members of Christ's kingdom are the sons of God, partners in his great firm. The elect of God are a chosen generation, a peculiar people. Boy, does that sound kind of familiar? Have we heard that before? Yeah. He said, he called us to be a peculiar people, right? a chosen generation, and we are that last generation in this last earth's history here. He says, a holy nation to show forth the praises of him who has called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, and that's all of them. All ten virgins were called out of the darkness into the light, but five were not ready, right? He said, out of the darkness and into his marvelous light, 
They are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. They are living stones, a royal priesthood. They are in what? Co-partnership with Jesus Christ. These are they that follow the Lamb wherever he goes. We have, we have a, a, a work to do. Jesus is saying that we have a, 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 a mission on this earth. Jesus is saying that he is calling us to be part of his, of his people, to be part of his kingdom. And he says, and they follow the lamb wherever he goes. And I'm going to just, we're going we're gonna to close now, but I want to I wanna just share a couple things. Uh, I'm going to ask for somebody to look up uh, a couple verses. One verse, we'll find it in 2 Corinthians. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. 2 Corinthians Chapter 11 and verse 2. And then if somebody else can look, look up Revelation chapter 3 and verse 4. And while you're looking at that, while you're looking at that, I just really wanted to say something. In this same chapter, chapter Revelation 14, 14 and 12, it says here, it says this. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. You know, it kind of, it, it just, you know, we've read this over and over again, but it was just a, a, a couple weeks back. It, this kind of dawned on me. And you guys forgive me if, I, if I'm over-reading into this, okay? If I over-read this. Uh, but I just wanted to, to share this with you real quick. This, this passage here shows us or tells us how God knows that we are his people. Right, part of it. And it's not the whole story, but part of it. He says here, he says, because here's the saints. Who are saints? You know, Satan will not call other people saints, right? He is the what? He is the accuser of the brethren. He's not going to call us saints. But God says, I know these are my people. These are the saints because they keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. So, I mean, we've heard is an I and I've, and I've used this text in the past, but to me it kind of seemed this is, this is a picture that says this is how God knows that we are his people. But you know what? Uh, and so it dawned on me in a little bit different context. You know what? Satan then has a test to know whose God people are as well. And I'm going to read here. This is the test that Satan knows who we are. God knows who we are because we keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. And the devil knows that we belong to God by this. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And you guys heard this. You know this one. He says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy, right? 1910. This is the test. And he says, if I know that they're studying God's words, if I know that they're not only keeping the commandments of God, but they're also studying the testimony of Jesus Christ. Because the testimony of Jesus Christ is to keep us safe, to prepare us for these last days. The testimony of Jesus Christ gives us our last day marching orders, right? Our last day uh, instructions on how to live a life and how to reach out. And, and how do we to live, you know, our dress, our health, all of these things. He says, we're going to do that. And so the devil knows it. And he says, and if you plan to do that, he said, then I'm going to be at war with you. And so sometimes maybe things don't come as easy. Maybe things don't always run as smooth. And it's not because God is punishing us. It's not because God doesn't love us. Not as because... A God isn't watching over us, not as that God doesn't care for us, but that we're at war. We have Satan's wrath and that we have to stand fast. And then we have to also then put on what? The armor of God, right? We have to be prepared every day. Okay, so who has 2 Corinthians 11 and 2? Okay, that's my sister. If you read that really loud for me. Wow, God says, I'm jealous. 
I want you for me, for myself, as a chaste, what? Virgin, right? The 144, here are they, they are virgins. They, they need no woman, they are virgins. He says that we have only one master, only one God, Jesus Christ. Nothing else, not entertainment, right? Not, not he says, you know, if you love your, your mother and your father more than me, or your, or your son or your daughter more than me, you're not worthy. Not anything. He says, I am to be number one object, just like you are in mine, right? You are to me. Okay, Revelations 3, 4, I think it was. Who has that? Okay, Brother Nathan. Okay. Amen. So we cannot, so he says, you know, I don't want you defiling your garments. I want you to keep those things clean. And it's tough, right? It's tough if we were, I mean, we don't do that nowadays here, uh, but we're doing that, that uh, uh, keepers of the flame are looking at it. And I says, you know, it just kind of comes the thought, you know, symbolically, you know, if Dr. Harvey Kellogg wore a white suit. Well, I bet you that thing was hard to go around and lecture and to teach and to preach and to keep clean, right? I think just symbolically, I'm just, I'm just thinking about that. You know, Jesus said, I want you to do that too. I'm going to put you on a white robe of righteousness, my robe of righteousness, and now we have to walk around and try to keep that thing clean. And sometimes we will, 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 will stain it, right? Sometimes we'll spill stuff on it. Hopefully it's by accident. And not on purpose, right? We wouldn't purposely uh, put anything on our clothes. He says, well, I don't want you spiritually purposely staining this, right, this robe of righteousness either. I want you to keep it clean. But fortunately, if we do stain it, we have remedy, right? He says, and again, my favorite verse has been for this year. It says, though, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and then to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, he cleanses. So we can't get down, right? But he says, have faith. Have faith. Make me number one. I am here and I'm ready to come home. I'm ready to take you home. But, you know that verse, it says, but when I come, will I find faith? Will I find faith on this earth? And so my challenge to you this morning is, do we have faith? But what is our faith like? Is our faith like the five wise virgins or is it like the five foolish virgins? Are we filling our, our flask, are we filling our cup with the oil of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Are we preparing? Are we ready? Or am I happy just to come on Sabbath morning and sit in the pew like we read in Ezekiel 33? All right. You might want to study that one a little bit more. Ezekiel 33. Where are we at? And that's my challenge to this morning. Uh, as I look around and like I said, it's, it's just, it, you know, it hits you heavy. Now, as, as a pastor, especially, I looked and I said, my God, here's Sister Kay. You know, she's been here for, for almost forever, right? For a long time. And I said, man, we have a lot of folks uh, elderly in our church. No, we need to. We need to be busy. They're not going to be here. They're not guaranteed to be here forever working and, and guiding us. They've, they've done their part. Amen? They've done, their, they've done their best. They have expanded their life. And, and, you know, really, that's who I see here for prayer meetings, uh, really, is, is, is the older folks, the older generations. They, they make the time out. It's important. I go, my, where, where are the younger folks in our church? Where are they at? Are they ready to be Sabbath school teachers? I mean, they've been in here long enough, right? They've been in church long enough. Are they ready? Are they ready to be the church clerk, the church treasurer, song leaders? Are they ready to put, and, and I know, I know that, my, that my, my older generation, my brothers and sisters have served for the years. I know they've all gone through their heartaches as well. I know they've all been hurt in the church at one time or another, right? And we too, are we ready to step up? Are we ready to lead? I want to challenge us this morning again. Where am I at? Am I? We're all, the, we're all here in the truth, in the purity of God's truth. We're all of those ten virgins. 
But uh, in those, within those ten virgins, am I of the five foolish or the five wise? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning to, to thank you and to praise you, Lord God, for this admonition that you give us, Lord God, to know that you love us and that you care for us, that you want us to be in that heavenly kingdom. You're drawing us to you, Lord Jesus. You want us to focus on you, that we are living in the last days, Lord God. And some of us, whether we, we anticipate it or not, Lord, just like our sister, that last day may come before your second coming, Lord. We don't know that, but we want to ask you, Lord Jesus, this morning that you would forgive us, Lord God, of being so uh, at ease with, with life's problems and life's uh, situations with work and, and, and the pleasures and other things. And we haven't focused on you, Lord God, of spreading your gospel message, of spreading this three angels message, Lord God, that you've given for this last generation. Lord, we just ask that you would fill us, fill our church, Lord God, with, with more wise virgins, Lord God. We ask that we can all learn to step up, Lord, that we can learn to say that we love you and that we're willing to make you number one in our lives. That your cause, Lord God, uh, your, the duty, the call to your duty, Lord, would be number one in our lives. And then you will give us time of rest, time of joy, when you come again in your clouds of power and glory. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and kindness in that most precious and holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen.